from Microbe TV. This is Infectious Disease Puscast, Episode 1, recorded on 4 27 22. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I am Daniel Griffin, and joining me today is Sarah Dong of uh, Febrile Podcast Fame. <laughs> Um, and for this first episode, I wanted to explain what what are we doing. Um, so we are continuing Mark Chrislip's Puscast um, with his um, Persiflagler blessing, um, and we're very excited. Um, Mark created, I think, a tremendous resource that I know I enjoyed for many years, um, and this is primarily a resource for practicing clinicians. Um, but we hope others find this interesting and entertaining. Um, this is going to be a review of the infectious disease literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. Um, so let us let us start. We're going to start off with a few. I'll say interesting viral papers. Um, but for COVID-related articles, listen to TWIB. We're going to try to keep this, uh, boy, this will be a somewhat COVID-free zone. We'll see how well that goes. Um, so the first article, translocation of an anteater, Tamandua tetradactyla, infected with rabies from Virginia to Tennessee, resulting in multiple human exposures, 2021. Um, and this, uh, this came out as a uh, case report. Um, and I found this rather interesting. So let me just go through this. Um, and we do promise up front, we're going to keep these to less than 30 minutes. So our busy clinicians can use this as a resource and um, have the ability to do this without, um, well, spending their entire life. So early <laughs> May 2021, a tamandua was translocated from a drive through zoo in Virginia where animals can be viewed from visitors' vehicles to a zoo in Washington County where it was kept in an indoor habitat uh, with one other tamandua and isolated from zoo visitors and wildlife. Um, this is sort of important because then this tamandua um, began exhibiting signs and symptoms of illness. Um, so this is an anteater, which um, apparently what is illness in an anteater? Lethargy, anorexia, diarrhea. Um, went ahead and actually finally um, at necropsy involving removal of brain tissue using an electric oscillating saw. Uh, brain tissue was submitted to an academic laboratory for histopathology. Um, and unfortunately, on August 21st, rabies virus antigen was confirmed in the brain of the Taman Dua. So this case apparently demonstrates that rabies translocation by human movement of captive animals, including species in which rabies has not been previously reported, can happen here in the United States. I did All not right. know the, the name of an uh, anteater was Tamandua until this <laughs> paper. I will admit, nor did I, and I think <laughs> De Pamier might be the only person I know. Well, actually, we have some friends at the uh, Bronx Zoo. Um, I bet they uh, know too. Yeah, I probably have read it on a zoo sign before. Um, well, I'll start us on our bacterial section, which is, I think, a bulk of what we have for today. Um, so I was going to mention a paper from the New England Journal by Eckberg and others on oral tebapenem and complicated UTI infections. And this is the ADAPT-PO trial, which is an international phase three randomized, double-blind, double-dummy, non-inferiority trial. And so they looked at the experimental regimen, which was oral tebapenem, um, and then a dummy fake urta infusion. And then they had a control arm looking at IV urtapenem every 24 hours, and then the dummy tebapenem pills. And so these were hospitalized patients with complicated UTI or acute pyelonephritis recruited from Europe, Africa, and the U.S. But if you look at it, it really was almost entirely from Europe. Um, and so these patients received 7 to 10 days for duration, although there were about 10% of the patients who had 14 days for bacteremia. And we had a little under 1,400 patients who were randomized and showed that the oral tebapenem was not inferior to the IV urtapenem based on the primary endpoint of test of cure visit overall response. So pretty close to 60% in each. And the clinical cure was over 90% in both groups. And they both had a pretty similar safety profile. So this is interesting. It's an oral option for ESBL and AMC producers. And I think 
kind of nice also to see a head-to-head trial of an oral medication versus an IV medication, which we actually don't get as much as I think you you think we would get an ID. Um, I think a lot of people have been talking about this because the prospect of an oral carbapenem can be a little bit scary. Um, but I think you know how this is going to get rolled out and restricted and managed through outpatient uh, stewardship programs will be interesting to see. And I suspect there will be a lot of uh, insurance hoops and expenses, at least in the U.S. Um, but I know there are other oral carbapenems that are in use in other countries. Uh, I didn't know a ton of them before reading this paper, though. I'm I'm slightly horrified and frightened, but uh, we will see. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. we do such a great job of antimicrobial stewardship in the outpatient setting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> Our next paper, Approaching 65 Years. This is not about Mark Chrislip. This is, it is a time to consider retirement of vancomycin for treating methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus endovascular infections. Um, Trying to figure out if Mark's listening, if he's going to take away um, his uh, letting us do this show after that comment. (laughs) Revoking. Um, (laughs) Is he going to revoke that? Um, But I'm not sure what everyone else is doing here, but um, I thought this was a fascinating paper. And, you know, we're, we're supposed to be reading them for you. So let me tell you what this paper <laughs> talked about. And Sarah's going to jump in and help me here. Um, so one of the big things, one of the reasons a lot of people, I think, continue to use vancomycin is this concept that is an inexpensive alternative to more expensive, newer options. One of the things they point out in this um, paper is that daptomycin, though a lot of people perceive it as more expensive, may actually be less expensive. They quote in this paper, I verified this myself with our local pharmacist, daptomycin costs about $30 a day. While vancomycin may be cheaper up front, um, when you start adding in the monitoring fees, uh, the impacts on renal function and other toxicities, it actually looks like vancomycin may be a more expensive alternative and it may actually be inferior. Um, one of the things that actually came up in this paper, and then I sort of realized expanding on this, was that the IDSA actually updated guidance on how to be treating with vancomycin in 2020. I don't know what everyone else was doing March 19th, 2020, when the <laughs> IDSA uh, published their new guidelines for vancomycin. I know what I was doing. Um, But I think people miss this and they're still following 2009 guidance where they're following troughs and targeting troughs um, for vancomycin 10 to 15 or 15 to 20. Um, But 2020, we're supposed to be moving on to new fancy guidelines. And I'll just uh, point these out um, in reference to this paper. The previous 2009 vancomycin consensus guidelines recommend trough monitoring as a surrogate marker for the target area under the curve over 24 hours for MIC concentration, AUC over MIC. However, recent data suggests that trough monitoring is associated with higher nephrotoxicity and the American Society of Health System pharmacists, the ID Society of America, the Pediatric ID Society, and the Society of Infectious Disease Pharmacists um, all now recommend using AUC over MIC ratios for monitoring your patients. Um, Sarah, are you doing that at your institution? I don't think they're doing that um, at my (laughs) institutions. We are doing some. I think it uh, depends on sort of what service they're on. We're trying to. But yeah, I feel like when this has come up, uh, it came out right in the middle of COVID. And I feel like as people were resurfacing, we were having more conversations about how this is being rolled out differently everywhere. So using a little bit of it, but I always have to ask for help and work with our ID pharmacist um, yeah, for the that'll, AUC That'll be my, my, you know, my sort of agreement on this. Ask for help with dosing yeah. of vancomycin. And one of the hospitals that I started to go to about five or six years ago, um, the, the pharmacist noted that only about 12% of the times were the ID docs getting those vancomycin um, to goal within 48 hours which is not really ideal. So um, work with your pharmacist if you're going to use vancomycin or maybe with this paper, you might want to be thinking about using alternative treatments. Maybe vancomycin is not the least expensive option. Yeah, it's a good reminder that daptomycin is not as expensive as we, I think we still perceive it as. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Well, my next one is also, I would say, preaching to the choir, but there was another paper noting that ID consultation improves care, this time with enterococcobacteremia. 
So uh, Dr. Thalani and others published an OFID on the impact of ID consultation on the outcome of patients with enterococcal bacteremia. They pulled 16 studies and a meta-analysis and, you know, found no difference, but if they limited those um, to those that reported the results of multivariate analysis, there was a protective relationship between ID consult and mortality. You know, th there certainly was some uh, variety and heterogeneous studies in this, but I, I think just another one in the bucket supporting that ID consults uh, do make a difference. All right. Well, the next paper was actually a paper apparently we both liked because it was in twice. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this apparently um, effect of gram stain guided initial antibiotic therapy on clinical response in patients with ventilator associated pneumonia, the GRACE VAP randomized clinical trial. Um, so this was a randomized clinical trial that included 206 patients with ventilator associated pneumonia in the intensive care unit. And they used good old uh, gram staining to reduce the use of anti-pseudomonal and anti-methicillin resistant staph aureus agents without any negative impact on care. And I'm probably dating myself, but when I trained last century. Um, we used to actually, when a patient got admitted, we, the uh, the interns, the residents, even the medical students, we would actually get the sputum, we would take it ourselves, do the gram stain, and then we would actually use this to guide our therapy. We actually used to spin urines and gram stain urines as well. Um, so I know Sarah has a bunch of comments, but one of the things that um, happened here, and I think this is important, is that initial gram stain guided therapy. There were sometimes, right, gram stains are not 100% where maybe the patient was was escalated to antipseudomonal or to MRSA coverage, but not starting off with those um, was not associated with worse outcomes. So just look at those sputums. I know a lot of people look at those sputums and say, oh, it's still preliminary and then move on, but you can look at them um, and it looks like we may be able to even improve our antimicrobial stewardship. Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I think trying to make sure that we uh, use this when we can. I, I will say that sometimes I think you, I've tried to use this as a way to de-escalate. I'm not sure it's always successful, um, but hopefully with papers like this, you can bring this to you when you talk to the ICU team about options that you have. Um, all right. And so our next one I have is looking at the effect of antimicro antimicrobial prophylaxis on healthcare associated infections after clean orthopedic surgeries. So Nagata and others uh, did a cluster randomized trial in one of the JAMA papers looking at about 1,200 adults and looked at those with less than 24 hours of antibiotic prophylaxis compared to 24 to 48 hours and showed that there was no difference with using a shorter prophylaxis in regards to the length of hospitalization, antibiotic resistance, and um, adverse effects. So I think something that we in ID know, but just another reminder that prolonged antibiotic prophylaxis, particularly in these uh, orthopedic surgeries, is, is really unnecessary. And in many ways, the risks of um, running into issues with the antibiotics or potentially developing resistance likely outweighs the benefit of them. All right. Now, this next one is something that just came up today. So I was glad to have this right at my fingertips. A desirability of outcome ranking door analysis of randomized clinical trial comparing seven versus 14 days of antibiotics for uncomplicated gram negative bloodstream infections. Um, so this comes all the time. Person's got E. coli, some other gram negative in the blood. How long do we treat? Do we treat for seven? Do we treat for 14? Can we switch to oral at some point? So this study looked at short course, seven days of antibiotics versus a quote unquote conventional course, 14 days in terms of mortality um, and infectious complications for patients with gram negative bacterial bloodstream infections. And they found no significant difference in terms of outcomes. So um, looks like we keep moving in this direction. Um, you know, when I, when I trained last century again, 21 days for pneumonia, and then we would yell at people if they didn't complete their 21 days, we're starting to realize we probably treated people for a little bit longer, quite a bit longer than we needed. And when we yelled at those patients, berated them for not finishing their antibiotics, they can now come back and say, doctor, you were treating me for too long. So <laughs> another, another shorter course works, um, not inferior to longer course. Yeah. And I think for me, reading about th this type of analysis, the... Um, 
outcome ranking, the paper does a really nice job kind of walking through and explaining it. So for those who haven't read about it, I felt like it was a really nice explanation for how that's done. And I think framing it in something that we talk about all the time on consults is really helpful. Um, and I think it's also, um, Sarah, I think it's important, you know, nothing we do is 100%. So, yeah. so many, you know, in my experience, right, that's what kills me, that knocks me down in my tracks. But you will fail. There will be about a 5% failure rate with a Staph aureus bacteremia, with mm-hmm. a gram-negative bacteremia. There will be a 5% failure rate whether you treat for 7 or 14 days. But people will always remember, oh, I remember I treated 7 days and I had a failure. You're going to have that at 14 days. That's why we need evidence-based medicine. So don't, don't practice medicine based upon that one in your experience, based on the literature. And we now have good literature supporting shorter course. Yeah. All right. And then I think I am wrapping up our bacterial section. This one's quick, but I thought was so interesting. Uh, In emerging infectious diseases, they reported two sporadic cases of Legionnaire's disease in commercial truck drivers, uh, which they ended up backtracking uh, and finding through environmental inspectors Legionella in their windshield wiper fluid for these uh, long-term truckers. So definitely not a question that I typically would ask in my social history, but uh, a really cool um, epi case, I think. All right. And then, you know, we were going to pick one article every time to try to give a little bit more background and a deep dive. And so the one that we picked this time Uh, has definitely come up. I think a lot of people have probably heard of it, but it is looking at single dose liposomal amphotericin B treatment for cryptococcal meningitis. So we're shifting into our fungal gears. This was by Jarvis and others in the New England Journal from earlier this month. Um, So many know that, you know, cryptococcal meningitis is the most common cause of adult meningitis in areas with high HIV prevalence and really is one of the leading causes of HIV related death. Um, particularly with a large burden in sub-Saharan Africa. And we know that there are a lot of problems with the conventional amphotericin, like renal dysfunction and anemia. And so the concept of using a one-time dose of liposomal amphotericin has been used before, such as in visceral leishmaniasis, um, but this paper also builds off of some other prior trials. Um, So this was the AMBITION trial, an open-label, phase three, randomized, controlled, non-inferiority trial. So I will walk through this. The experimental regimen was on day one, a one-time dose of liposomal amphotericin B at 10 mg per kg, along with a 14-day course of flucytosine, 100 mg per kg orally, and then high-dose fluconazole at 1,200 mg per day. So that's your experimental regimen. And then they compare this to the control of amphotericin B deoxycholate, one milligram per kg per day, with flucytosine at the same dose for a week. And then the second week was the high dose fluconazole orally. And they looked at adults with HIV who were over the age of 18 with their first episode of cryptococcal meningitis. Um, This was in five African countries, Botswana, Malawi, South Africa, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. Um, And they looked for their primary endpoint of death from any cause at 10 weeks after randomization. Um, There were several secondary endpoints, including death from any cause at other time points, as well as the rate of fungal clearance from the CSF and the percentage of participants with adverse effects. And they ended up randomizing about 840 patients, ultimately having approximately 400 people in both groups for the intention to treat analysis, which amazingly, there was no one lost to follow up, which is incredible, I have to say. Um, these, this was a pretty sick population. The median CD4 count was 27, um, and the arms were well-matched. So the difference when all-cause mortality at 10 weeks was 24.8% in the experimental arm with the one-time dose of the liposomal amphotericin B versus 28.7% in the control arm. Um, And so the adjusted analyses favored liposomal amphotericin as well, and it showed a similar um, difference with the early fungicidal activity, so the rate of clearance of the fungus from the CSF. Um, so this is great. This was a huge crypto meningitis trial. It's a regimen that has similar or lower mortality. It looks like equal clearance of cryptococcus from the CSF and really a less toxic and potentially less expensive regimen overall. Um, so 
I mean, I think I expect that this will change the WHO guidelines. Um, I don't know what you think, Daniel. Uh, so I think it's huge having having practiced in some of these resource limited areas. The idea yeah. that you have to have someone hospitalized for a week that you have to give yeah. them is really difficult to tolerate. Uh, you know, a week of info terrible, right? As we we still mm-hmm. call it. Um, so I think it's going to real. I think this is a huge potential game changer. Um, yeah. I think this is going to be a big change. And and I have to say, I was shocked, um, you know, when, when I heard that cryptococcal meningitis is the number one presenting opportunistic infection in sub-Saharan Africa and the HIV population. I was um, talking to a friend of mine, El Munter from uh, Kuwait. It's like, that that can't possibly, yes, it is. And having yeah. been at a meningitis hospital in Kampala, um, this is a huge problem for sub-Saharan Africa. And the idea that we can actually have a non-inferior approach that involves, really, you could treat once, with the IV and then move to an oral regimen. Um, I think this is tremendous. It also says quite a bit at, about how well they do with HIV in sub-Saharan Africa. They're really good at keeping track of these folks, getting them on medicine, mm-hmm. not losing them to follow up. We don't really do so well here in the U.S. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's interesting to think about how it'll impact us here in the U.S. where I'd say most of us probably aren't using deoxycholate regularly for the amphotericin formulation um, and thinking about how this, you know, potentially could be generalized to other populations like transplant patients or other folks who run into a lot of the difficulties with the long-term amphotericin B treatment. All right. And we'll move into parasitic now and uh, be sure to listen to This Week in Parasitism. Uh, We'll cover a lot more there, but I've got um, a couple articles here to bring up. High prevalence of plasmodium falciparum K13 mutations in Rwanda is associated with slow parasite clearance after treatment with artemether. Luma fan train. Um, so th- this I was a little concerned about. In Southeast Asia, mutations in the plasmodium falciparum K13 gene have led to delayed parasite clearance and treatment failures um, in patients receiving artemisin combination therapies. But until recently, um, we were not seeing this in Africa. Um, between 2018 and 2019, a phase two clinical study with 186 patients was conducted in Malawi, Gabon, Ghana, Uganda, and Rwanda. Patients with malaria were randomized and treated. Um, These authors reported an allele frequency of 22% uh, for the R561H in Rwanda and associated delayed parasite clearance. So 22%, um, that is less than ideal. These mutations are in the propeller domain. This is for our clinicians, so I'm not going to go much more into that. And I know I'm sort of stepping outside the zone where a lot of our US-based physicians, but uh, we are are talking to a global audience. So um, I think this is a bit concerning. And the other, which really hits on an arc we started in this week in parasitism, association of reduced long-lasting insecticidal net efficacy and perethroid insecticide resistance with overexpression of CYP6P4, CYP6P3, and CYP6Z1 in populations of Anopheles Kaluzi from Southeast Cote d'Ivoire. Ivoire. Am I saying that right? <laughs> Greater than 25% of mosquitoes survived exposure to 10 times the doses of pyrethroids required to kill susceptible populations. The mosquitoes are developing insecticide resistance. <sighs> All right. So for our wrap up, I think we have succeeded in our promise of keeping this short and focused on the important uh, literature. Um, you can find Infectious Disease Puscast at Apple Podcasts, Microbe TV, microbe.tv forward slash Puscast, and on your favorite podcatcher. Um, we we will love to get your questions and comments. This is our first one, so we don't have any yet, um, but send those to Puscast at microbe.tv um, and consider supporting the science shows of Microbe TV at microbe.tv forward slash contribute. You can find Sarah Dong on Twitter at Sarah. S. Win Dong or at febropodcast.com or on Febro Podcasts uh, on Twitter. All right. And I'm Daniel Griffin and you can find me at parasiteswithoutborders.com. Um, Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another Another podcast is is infectious. infectious.